everyone is familiar with complaints. Um, if you deal with people on any level, you'll face complaints. Today, I want to talk about handling complaints. There's people that are, are just amazing at complaining. And uh, if you've been around at all, you've, you've heard and you've given some complaints about some things. Um, how many of you, by raise of hands, have complained about something this week? Raise your hand. Think about that. There's people with a couple hands up and their legs up. and Okay. Um, I would guess that if you're sitting next to a person, they didn't raise their hand, and you see them and you're like, no, you, you really did complain. Eh, maybe you don't want to admit to that, but there was a complaint of what you did over there. Complaints are normal. Um, do you know Amazon? How many of you get packages from Amazon? Yeah, there's a lot of us, right? Do you know Amazon has, uh, from the Better, Better Business Bureau, they have over 33,000 complaints in the last three years. That's a lot. That's people that were irritated enough to go to the Better Business Bureau. Apple, a lot of people have Apple products, right? Apple, in the past three years, have had 16,000 complaints to the Better Business Bureau. Over 16,000. That's a lot of complaints. I mean, think about the reality of this. And if you're on the receiving side of complaints, what do you do about that? And maybe you've been on the giving side of complaints to either of those organizations, companies. Complaints are normal. Acts chapter 6 is where we are this morning. And I want to highlight this and help us understand that complaints are normal, but here we have to think about how we're going to handle them. We all have something that we probably want to complain about at different points, and we've all had someone complain to us about something at different points. So in Acts chapter 6, Jamie read it, so I just want to go through the text here this morning. We're going to spend a bit of time in the first couple verses and then finish out the, uh, the, the last seven verses of what we're dealing with today. It says, now in those days, the disciples were increasing in number. And so people that were following Jesus, they were increasing num in number. That more and more people were coming to know who Jesus was and to follow him. It was an exciting time. But then it says in the second part, And a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now let me explain this. Who are the Hellenists? The Hellenists are a group of people that held to the Hebrew language and the old traditions of the, the Hebrew uh, perspectives. And, and so they were complaining then about the, uh, the others and saying to the, the Hebrews, that they were saying, hey, you're doing something wrong here, and they were the more contemporary, if you will. And, and so they're saying to them, you are, com you are doing something wrong. You're not taking care of the widows. The widows are those that are disabled or those that didn't have the ability to take care of themselves because their, their husband had passed. And so they're, they're taking care of them in this kind of way. They would take up a collection within the congregation or within the community or group, and, and then they would care for the widows. So this church that's forming, you have thousands of people, this kind of mega church that's all over the place in this area, is getting this complaint. Maybe not to the Better Business Bureau, but it's, it's a complaint that's given to the disciples. It's hard to say whether these are people that are part of that church community, or just outsiders that are looking in and kind of throwing rocks at them. It's hard to really recognize that. But the truth is that even if it's people within the church— do you know people in the church complain too about their own church? Is that surprising? Amazing. It happens once in a while, right? And, and so it could be people within the church complaining about their own church, or it could be people outside the church complaining about the church and, and such. And I, I think it'd be good to pause, though, because the first five verses, you see Jesus ascend from earth to heaven— and commissions the disciples that when the Holy Spirit is working, you're going to go out and you're going to tell everybody about who I am. And as they did, God's Spirit worked in such a way that thousands upon thousands of people came to know Jesus and begin to follow him. Now, perspective. If we saw that in our day, where thousands upon thousands upon pe like people in our community, in Camden County, Gloucester County, and in just these couple counties right here, 
If you had 10,000 people that in the past few weeks came to know who Jesus was and everyone noticed, you would take this criticism and you would kind of hear it differently. Because they're on top of the mountain. Things are going awesome. Things are going great. And, and to have this kind of complaint is weird. And, and they're, they're seeing people be so generous and they're caring for one another. They're selling their things and giving to people. It's an amazing time in history for the church. People are being healed. There's amazing miracles that are happening at the same time. How do you feel? Think about this. How do you feel when you do 99 things right and someone picks on one thing that you're doing wrong? You ever been there? Have you been there? Okay, only about half of you. Come on now. You haven't had a teacher do that? Sorry, Rebecca. Right? You, you haven't had a teacher say, well, you got 99 out of 100. Well, you kind of missed uh, something over here. You haven't had a spouse do that, a parent do that, a boss do that. Where you're doing great, but this one thing, I, I have to let, just... Let me point out this one thing that you're not... How do you feel at the end of that? I mean, you kind of want to punch him in the throat, right? Okay, maybe not. But, but you, you, it irritates you. It's hard to hear some things like this. Do you ignore it? Argue? Blame others? Tell others how annoying they are? I can't believe what they said. Do you make excuses? Or do you listen? Like, what do you actually do? Before we answer that, I think it'd be good to look at the complainer. So in this text, you have the Hellenists that are complaining about the Hebrews. They're saying you're doing something wrong. And, and when you look at life, and probably in our room here, we have a whole bunch of people that have complained recently and maybe complained frequently. I won't ask for the frequent complainers, right? But we have that where we have some people that complain on a frequent basis because you see things that are just, they bother you, they annoy you, right? It just gets on your nerves. And what do you do with that? Do you just stuff it? The Hellenists, they didn't stuff it. They shared it. Is that right or wrong? Because we kind of live in a culture that's passive-aggressive. The, the passive-aggressive part of this culture is, if I have a problem with you, I stuff it until I, like, maybe I'll say something online, Facebook or something, social media, and maybe won't add all the names or something like that, but I'll trash you there. And I see that quite frequently. Somebody's parking at the wrong spot, and you take a picture of their vehicle, and you post it on the local page. Hey, check out this jerk, you know? Wow, that's real nice. It's kind of a passive-aggressive way of doing it or just kind of blasting them in some sort of way. And, or some people bottle it up until they just kind of let them have it when they just can't take it anymore. It's a Popeye moment of, I'm just going to let you have it because I, I, I've, just, I, I've had it up to here. Well, that's not great. So here's the thing. I, I want to give you three points that are for the complainer giving complaints and the same three points for the person listening that's getting, that's receiving the complaint. But you've already heard these because I've preached on this before. And when I share this, you're going to be like, why you preached on this before? But this is important. Through this text, you're going you're gonna to hear it and see it. Now, I want you to grab onto it from both perspectives because I think sometimes we ignore the complaining part. The fact that I have something that's bothering me, so, that something's on my heart, that something's not right. What do I do with that? So here's what we want to do. As you take that complaint that you might have with someone else um, in, in your workplace or in church or in your home or wherever you might be, what do you do? Here's the three things. You want to listen, evaluate, then trash or transform. Same three points on both sides, okay? Here's what the Hellenists were doing. They listened to what was happening. They were attentive to the things that were going on. They didn't walk by with a blind eye, not caring. They had something going on in the brain that they were seeing what was really happening. They were attentive. They were listening to it. They didn't ignore it. And here's what 
we should be doing, we should always be aware of our surroundings to the degree that we know the problems that we're faced with. We can see things clearly. That's just seeing truth. I see it for what it is, or I see it for what I see it as. It could be both of those things. So the Hellenists, they listened to what was happening. And, and then the second part is you have to evaluate the importance uh, enough to share it. You have to determine, is this really important? Should I share something? Should I talk about this? Now, how do you define that? Because if I'm aggravated enough, I just want to share it. I mean, if it bothers me, i got to get it off my chest and let you have it, right? It makes me feel so much better when you hear what I have to say. Well, you have to evaluate as to whether it's important enough to share. Is it your personal preference? Is it something that is just simply your opinion? Because if it's just your opinion or your prefer personal preference, then it doesn't always have to be shared. Right? Well, I don't like the color of this. That's great. That's your personal preference. That's your opinion. You don't have to share that. Your hair looks like you just got out of bed. That's great. You like your hair done differently. That's just your personal preference. You don't have to share that. It's, listen, it's not to, I, I've got to be honest and tell you how I feel. No, 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 you don't. You don't have to share everything. God's not called us to that. What's the proverb say? Only a what speaks his whole mind. Right, right. So, so in that, we understand that just because their hair is a little different, or just because their clothes are different, or just because their car is different, or because something is different about them does not force us into this position where we must share, right? We have to actually do this discernment, eva evaluation process, and determine whether we should or should not share in those moments, so that we don't become that fool. So we evaluate, maybe it's outside of a personal preference. In that, it's a clear conviction. This is a mandate. This is a conviction. It would be something where you watch abuse happen in front of you. You watch an unkind thing where, you know, someone is... is yelling, hollering, cussing, or unkind, and you just kind of step in and say, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's back up. There's some clear conviction, and, and it's, it's literally in God's word as well as you're dealing with a church setting. You're looking and saying, this is how God's word should be applied consistently. It's a conviction as to how you see things there. Martin Luther, in uh, the 1500s, he was the beginner of what we would know as the... Um, Protestant Reformation, I was saying a different word in my head. The Protestant Reformation, right? So in the 1500s, what happened is he's in the Catholic Church, and that was the main denomination, main church in that time. And he was so frustrated with some things that were going on in how they uh, took the indulgences and how they collected money and several other things. And he was just absolutely aggravated. Because what he did was he took God's word, which he was absolutely convicted about, and he took it and he studied it cover to cover. And he understood very detailed how this should play out and work. And he was a brilliant mind. Matter of fact, he translated the New Testament uh, into Latin, which was a huge feat in that moment in time. But when you look at what he did, he was part of and a leader within the Catholic Church in that region. He was so frustrated with some things that were conviction-oriented. That what he did was, he wrote the, what is called the 95 Theses. He took this paper, in a sense, and he wrote 95 things. They said, we need to talk about these things within our church group here. And so what he did then is he nailed it onto kind of the, the poster area of where they would say, here's our dialogue points. And he nailed it up there to provoke them to have a conversation. Well, that didn't go so well. The church leaders didn't want to have anything to do that. Thus started the Protestant Reformation. What's interesting about him is he stayed within that context and he continued to mentor and disciple people within the context of that church and continued to lead forward. That was the beginning. Then you'd have John Calvin and you'd have others that followed suit. But here's the point I'm trying to make. 
Martin Luther, back in the 1500s, we would never know this person outside of the fact that he was so convicted about biblical truth, the conviction of God's word, that he stood strong on it within the church even, and he nailed it up and he says, guys, we must do something here. It's tremendous. And if you want to read through that, it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff to read through all of that and see the history of that uh, as well. But here, these Hellenists, they had to decide, okay, and evaluate, is this something that I should be convicted about? Is there people within this, and, and how I would define a conviction, is there people within this that the relationship with God or others uh, is being compromised by the way things are going? In that your relationship with God is compromised when God's word is not taught and preached accurately. It's that, that your relationship with God is compromised when you are treating people or, are tr- or treated wrongly and, and you're going in the wrong direction away from God's word. That's clear. And then in relationship with one another, you look and say, okay, this is a conviction. We need to treat others in a way that is correct and right. And so they were looking and saying, these Hebrews, you're, you're not taking care of the widows right. It's, it's, you should be, this should be an embarrassment to you. And so then the third thing is to trash or transform. It's as the complainer, you look and you've now listened to what's going on. You've observed it. You're evaluating the, the process. Should I share this? Is this just my personal preference or is this conviction? And then you go and say, okay, let's trash or transform. If it's just personal and I know this is not going to help, it's just, hey, your hair, I'm not, it's not going to help. I trash it. But if it's in the transform pile, then I need to do this in a correct way. So you determine to be godly. That's transformational. God's, do you, do you realize, church, do you realize we are called to be transformational in the way that we handle each other as a church? We're not called to just gather. Do you realize that? Jesus did not put the church together so that we would simply gather. Jesus put the church together so that we would be transformative in how we approach one another. So that as we are doing this relationship together, we are literally standing in front of each other, caring for each other to the degree that we share some serious things in a healthy way. Ephesians chapter 4 outlines this. Verse 15, he says, speak the truth in love. That means you have to be very deliberate in what you are saying. Now, in our way that we do things, we love to speak the truth. We love to speak the truth, but we're not always loving. We, we like to put people on blast, right? I'm going to let you have it. I gave him a piece of my mind. I said what I had to say. Well, that's not biblical. Biblical is I'm going to speak the truth in a loving way. That I'm looking out for you in what I'm saying. I'm not looking out for me. I may not get that lump out of my chest that I have because of what's going on, because I'm holding certain things together so that I can care and love you in the process. Ephesians 4, 32, it, it, the, that's the kind of the parenthesis of the passage where you look at the end, he says, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ's sake has forgiven you. So to be kind is to go, I'm, I'm going to put you first in this way. To be tenderhearted is to hold in the things that would be offensive and hurtful. And forgiving, oh, that's so hard because my reaction is bitterness and anger and I'm frustrated with you. But instead, I'm going to be forgiving and pouring out grace in our relationship. So you treat them with grace then. We say here all the time, we're all work in progress, right? Is it true? If we believe it, then anytime we see a complaint against someone, we should view them in that way. Can I remind us that God is the God of process. He takes his time with us. He allows us to grow over time, and we should be that way with each other. So here's the reality of all of this. God's goal for us is to grow closer to him, and sometimes we need to complain, which can help them to grow. 
It's not that complaining is wrong. It's that we do this in, with the intent and desire to help someone grow closer to Jesus Christ as a result. It's part of the sanctification process. Now, let's do the other side. You ready? What do you do when you're complained against? Well, here's what the disciples did. Go back to our text, verse 2. In the 12, they summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching in the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute or reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom you, we will appoint for this duty. And so here's what they were doing. They demonstrated they were, they were listening. That while these people came up to them and said, We've got a problem. You need to do something. This is bad. They actually listened to the complaint. While they had a million things that were going right, and they were seeing people coming to Christ, and they could have totally ignored them and say, look, whatever. They could have done any of those things. They could have blamed. They could have shifted around. They could have shamed them for bringing any attention to them. They could have done any of that. But instead, they listened intently to what they said. So they heard it. So there's no argument. When we listen... We need to listen to understand the problem. That's hard work. Right? I had that yesterday. And I, I told Mel I was going to talk about this today. So this is pre-approved. Mel came up to me. I'm doing some construction uh, on my house. And I had some things torn out. De 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 demolishing something and it was just dirt and stuff everywhere and so i had my tools out and things like that doing this little uh, project and i had my ladder but i had to move some things earlier in the day and i had her ladder now the, you know there's a difference between her ladder and my ladder yes okay her ladder is clean her ladder does not have paint on it her ladder is not scratched up beat up you know, it doesn't have any of those things on it. It's a nice, clean ladder that we use to get, like, we have 10-foot ceilings in the, downstairs. And so in order to get to certain things, you need a ladder to get up on the shelves and get the th things down. And so when she came in, wives, maybe you can relate a little bit. She came in. She made me aware of the problem. Yes? She had every right to do that, to be able to share, hey, um, this ladder over here, you know, my nice one that's covered in dirt right now. Do you have maybe another one that you could use in its place? And we had a nice little discussion about this. Okay. Now, I had a choice. Was she right by sharing the, the, that the ladder was being used inappropriately? Ladies, you with? How many agree, ladies? She should share that. Okay, all right. Men, you can jump in on this too, but please don't for my sake, right? Okay. All right, so, so ladies, you're there. Now, what's my position in this? My position is, huh, don't you see, woman, I got all this work going on. I'm doing all, like, that's, like, okay, you, men, you with me? Oh, yeah. Okay. But if I'm going to listen, which I had to work at, because I'm not perfect. I had to understand what she was saying. I had to listen and understand. So what you're saying is the dirt that's on there bothers you. And to be honest, I never thought about the dirt being on the ladder being a problem. But now that you say that, that's interesting. And I had to kind of pull back a little bit and say, oh, all right, I get it. I do have another ladder outside. I could definitely use that other ladder. And I hear what you're saying. That's listening, yes? To the degree that she knows that I understand that what she's communicated is being heard. It, different than if I were to just kind of be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. Have I listened to her, ladies? <laughs> I haven't because, yes, I hear the information, but it doesn't mean anything to me. But if I hear it, and then I'm able to say, which I did 10 minutes later after I kind of digested a little bit, because I'm slow with this, some of these things, I was able to say, I get what you're saying, and I respect you for saying that. That's listening, yes? Not because I'm the hero of the story, but because I know that the gospel is the hero for my life. 
and that God's doing a transformational work in me that I'm realizing today after being married 29 years that I'm starting to get a clue once in a while with some of these things, even the slightest little thing like a ladder of how to love and how to listen effectively. Just once, And you could share your stories too, right? Because you've done this too. Uh, you've got your own ladder story or whatever. But that's what it is. It's that you're listening to understand the problem. People crave relationships that, that, that people actually listen. So here's what they did. They listened and they demonstrated that. And then they evaluated, is the problem something to deal with? Is it just their personal preference of the Hellenists? Or do we just kind of move on and say, hey, thanks for the thing. We'll file that away in chapter 13. Or do they have to take some action? Well, in this case, they had to take action because people were being hurt, neglected. And that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is not the one who neglects. Jesus is not the one who doesn't care. Jesus is the one that cares all the time and has put us in a position where we should be caring and loving as he did for us. So they evaluated and realized we need to do something about this. And so then they communicated. They didn't trash. And that's the third point, right? Trash or transform. They, they use this as a transformational moment within the church community. And so they shared then together. And they said, therefore, brothers, hey, we're in this together. And they made this a public thing. This is what we're going to do. And, and listen, when there's a complaint against you, a great thing to do in the end is to follow up with the person that complained against you and say, thank you for sharing that. This is what I'm doing as a result. And that's what they're doing. In a public way, they're getting everyone together and they're saying, hey, this is a problem. We get it. We're going to fix it. And we're going to do it right now. We're not waiting. We're not getting a committee together. We're, we're going to fix it right now. And I need everybody's help to fix this because we can't let this happen any longer than what it's already happened for. And so they do, they address the problem with everybody, and, and they pull them together, and, and they get them to make some decisions. Now, now, pause just for a moment. When someone complains against you, when you're doing 99 things right, and one thing they find that's wrong, do you know what the tendency is? The tendency, and here's, I want to guard your heart here a little bit with God's word and the gospel and how it really works in our lives. The tendency is, that once someone points out that one thing out of 99, Satan uses that, manipulates our heart around, and causes us to do one of three things. One, to desert God's word. One, or, or two, is to get discouraged. And number three, is to get distracted. To desert God's word is to say, I'll do it my way. I don't need God in it. And so the response is, I'm going to be unkind. I'm going to shame you for saying that. I'm going to blame you. And so you desert God's word. And Satan loves to do that because that's what brings out a division and brokenness in relationships. There's no reconciliation in it. Because we're not demonstrating the gospel. The gospel is all about reconciliation, bringing relationships together between us and God and with each other as well. And so Satan wants to do that. One, he wants to get us there, or he wants to get us distracted. And here's what the disciples did not do. They, they said, look, we, we're called, our calling is to God's word, to preach it, to study it, and to pray for you. That's our calling. And we're not going to get distracted. And I believe Satan does a, a, a huge work at getting people distracted from what their calling is in handling the complaints all the time. And they're so busy handling complaints that they're not fulfilling their calling. Or the third thing is discouragement. Say, well, yeah, I am a lousy leader. Yeah, I did mess up over there. And even though it's one out of a hundred, you take that one and you make that the hundred. And it takes you away. It kind of pulls you out of the game. The discouragement is I don't have the courage to move forward any longer. And so we just kind of sit, maybe catatonically, or we just sit in our, in our chair and we say, well, I'm no good. And we kind of have this mantra going on, and Satan loves it when we do that. It's that spiraling down where we say, I'm no good at this, I'm lousy at, and you have this mentality that goes on. We need to guard our heart from this. Because what should happen is, God is at work. God is doing amazing things. God is using me. And if there's a complaint, I want to deal with it. And by God's grace, I'll understand. I'll evaluate and I'll see a transformational work happen as a result of this. That's what the disciples literally did. They said, uh, there, there's something good that's going to happen as a result of this complaint. 
And so what they did was they put things together in verse 3 through 7. They put things together. They said, hey, select from you some guys that are godly, that, that we can set aside for this test to make sure this happens and takes care of it. We are not leaving preaching. We are not leaving praying. We're staying there so you find some people that can do it. And so they did. The church agreed. This is verse 5. They, they agreed. It says they, 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 they all were together in this. And, and then they set these guys apart. They prayed for them. And the list is in verses 6 and 7, of the, or 5 and 6, that, of the people that they were praying for. And here's what happened verse 7. I love the ending of this. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. They handled complaints in a way that was godly and honorable with each other. They dealt with it in a way that said, okay, let's solve this by including everybody in on the problem and making sure everybody can see it and dealt with it in a way that they could move forward together. And as they did, the word of God, not their fame, not their name, not anything else, the word of God which is the most important thing here, the word of God increased, that people understood God's word that much more. They were like, oh, I get it. When you have a complaint, here's what you're supposed to do. That's what they did. Oh, that looks just like what Jesus did to me. And the word of God increased, and they grew, and people came to know who Jesus was. And it even says at the end of the verse, I love that, and even the priests became obedient to the faith. That they were obedient to the religion, and they changed over because they could see it clearly now that they became obedient to the faith. They were followers of Jesus first and foremost. The word of God is what we should be passionate about seeing go forward. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable it's not just a book that we read, but it has profit for instruction, for godliness, and leads us forward, correction in, in righteousness. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, talks about the word of God. It performs surgery on our heart and soul and leads us into a healthy relationship with God and others as a result. So, we need to handle complaints in a godly way, Yes? makes sense. It's like, oh yeah, we should handle complaints in a godly way. It's not in a passive way. It's not in a, I'm going to attack you and shame you way. It's not in a god ungodly way, but it's in a godly way. And we have to realize that God is the God of process. God is the God of process. I was reading a book this week um, by another pastor uh, down in North Carolina, and he's writing this book on leadership within the church and, and within that he talks about training leaders and he says one of the qualifications or one of the things he teaches with the leaders is patience. He said, he said leaders, you have to be patient with people. Change does not happen overnight. It takes time. And you have to work at it and work at it and work at it. Like a farmer in the field, uh, like anything that we do that has any kind of worth to it, it's going to take time. You have to be patient. But you can't just sit back and do nothing. You have to actually be working at it, was his point. God is the God of process. That's where we get that from. God is so patient with us. He's long-suffering. He's faithful. He's kind. He's gracious. He's full of truth. So here's my question. How can you be more godly as you handle complaints? How can you be more godly as you handle complaints? Whether you have a complaint toward someone or you are receiving a com complaint from someone, what is it that you should do more effectively as a result of hearing God's word? Should you be a better listener? that you see things better around you, that you see what they're saying, that you understand them? Should you be a better evaluator, that you see so much and you're not sure whether you should say something or not, and you evaluate it more before you just speak your mind? Or you evaluate what other people say, and instead of taking it to heart and destroying yourself, you're evaluating it in a way that's godly and right, and you figure out the trash or transform as a result. Which one is it that you need to be working on today to become more godly and how you handle complaints. You see, people stop growing 
when nothing bothers them. People stop growing when nothing bothers them. It's apathy. You're not even seeing the surroundings. Nothing bothers you anymore. Or when someone says something to you, it doesn't even affect you. You're just living in the land of nobody. God's created us to have passions to, to be pushing forward and to continue to grow. And as we do, we will experience complaints toward and complaints from. So handle it in a way that's godly and grow in it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this example of a church that did it well. And Lord, we all will face complaints consistently. Lord, help us to be godly in how we handle it. Help us to grow in you. That this week as we do, that we would see victories in your name. That we would depend on you. That we would see your spirit working mightily in us. To speak well in the way that you would want us to. And Lord, as, as we work through different things here in our ministry, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see your word increase more and more. And Lord, help us to reach people in a way that honors you and to handle complaints in a way that is godly. And we'll give you the praise for all that you accomplish. Through Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Go and be godly today as you leave. Thanks.